Hey guys, I'm back with you today um, to share with you Maniac McGee. I'm going to be reading chapters 29, 30, 31, and 32. So let's get started. Chapter 29. For most of November, Winter toyed with two mills, whispered in its ear, tickled it under the chin. On Thanksgiving Thursday, Winter kicked it in the stomach. But that didn't stop the old man and the boy from joining the 10,000 who thronged to the stadium on the boulevard to see the traditional high school football game. The Arctic air laid panes of ice over the crayfish edge pools of Stony Creek. The effect was the opposite on human noses. Maniacs and Graysons ran like faucets and not a handkerchief in sight. They deputized their sleeves and grabbed handfuls of napkins from the refreshment stand. Two Mills won the game thanks to a last-minute 73-yard TD pass from quarterback Denny to James hands down. From the instant his old trash-talking Sandlot pal cradled the ball in his long brown fingers, Maniac was jumping on his seat, screaming trash at hands pursuers every step to the goal line and glancing about to make sure Mrs. Beal wasn't hearing by the time they got back to the baseball room, they were nearly frozen, but the freeze was good for it made the warmth of the little apartment all the more welcome. Within 15 minutes, the space heater had the place positively tropical while in the toaster oven, their five pound Thanksgiving chicken was already being beginning to brown. A pair of hot plates and a squad of pots were pressed into action and by mid-afternoon, the two were sitting down to a feast of roast chicken, gravy, cranberry sauce, applesauce, spaghettios, raisins, pumpkin pie, and butterscotch crumpets. Maniac thought of Thanksgiving's past, of sitting around a joyless table, his aunt and uncle as silent and lifeless as the mammoth bird they gnawed on. He said his grace, dear God, we want to take this opportunity to thank you for the best Thanksgiving dinner we ever had. Well, I ever had. I guess I shouldn't speak for my friend Grayson. He peeked across the table. Grayson, he whispered, is this your best one too? The old man opened one eye. He shrugged. Don't know. I ain't tasted it yet. Maniac glared, rolled his eyes upward, hissed. Grayson? The old man flinched. Oh, yeah. He squinted one eye at the chicken. Yeah, I guess it is. The best. Maniac prompted, the best. Maniac went on, and we want to thank you for this warm house and for our own little family here and for Grayson learning to read. He's already read 13 books. I'm sure you already know. And one more thing, if you could find some way to let the Beale family know that I'm wishing them a happy Thanksgiving, I'd really appreciate it. They're the ones on 7028 Sycamore Street, in case there's any other Beals around. Amen. Amen, said Grayson. They stuffed themselves silly, then collapsed and listened to polka music. Grayson had brought over a record player a week before, along with his entire music collection, 31 polka records. Grayson loved polkas. Of course, one cannot listen to polka music for long before getting up and dancing, which is what the two Thanksgivingers did as soon as their bloated stomachs allowed. They danced and laughed, record after record. Whether it was the polka that they danced is the question is another question. It was nearly dark, both of them having recollapsed when Maniac said, Is there any paint around? Guess so, said Grayson. What for? You'll see. Can you get some and a brush? The old man dragged himself up. What color? How about black? Five minutes later the old man was back. Got brown, that do? Fine, said Maniac. He opened the can, stirred the paint put on a jacket and grabbed the brush and went outside. Grayson followed. He watched the kid paint the outside of the door in careful strokes. One, zero, one. Maniac stepped back admiring his work. One, oh, one, he proclaimed. One, oh, one, Banshell Boulevard. If Thanksgiving was wonderful, Christmas was paradise. By now, Grayson had officially moved out of the Y and into 101 Banshell Boulevard. Thanks to his long acquaintanceship with the locker room attendant, he and Maniac were privileged to continue using the Y shower facilities at their pleasure. 
For decoration outside, they nailed a wreath to the door. There was only one small window, but it had no sill to hold a candle, so some spray snow had to do. Inside was another story. Santa's elves themselves would have felt at home. Strings of popcorn swooped across the ceiling. Evergreen branches flared at random, dispersing their piney aroma. Wherever there were a few vacant square inches, something Christmassy appeared. A matchbox, creche, creche, a porcelain Santa, a partridge, and a pear tree. One day, Grayson dragged a pair of tree limbs in and started swatting away. I saw, sorry, started sawing away. When he was finished, a wooden reindeer stood in the room big enough for Maniac to ride. Of course, the tree got the most attention of all. By the time the two of them finished trimming it, their tree trimming instincts, having languished for so many Christmases, hardly a pine needle could be seen under the tinsel and balls and whatnot. In fact, they were so delighted with their effort, the urge to trim was still full upon them. One room was simply too small to hold the spirit bursting. So they went outside and crossed the creek and tramped the, the woods until they came to a fine and proper evergreen. And there, their footsteps muffled by the carpet of pine needles, their every breath and whispered word arrayed in frosty white, they trimmed their second tree. This time, the ornaments were nature's brilliant red and yellow necklaces of bittersweet, pungent pine cones, wine red clusters of sumac berries, abandoned bird body boats of milkweed, delicate thumb sized goblets of Queen Anne's lace. Chapter 31. It was still dark when Maniac awoke on Christmas morning. Within an hour or two, the holiday would come bounding down the stairs. Uh, and squealing round the tinsel shit, the tinseled trees of two mills. But for the moment, Christmas bided its time outside a purer presence. Maniac shook Grayson awake, but stayed the old but stayed the old man's hand when he reached to turn on the light. They bundled themselves and ventured into the silent night. Maniac carried a paper bag. Snow had fallen several days before in much of the town. It had been plowed, shoveled, and slushed away. But in the park, along the creek, the woods, the playing fields, the playground, it still lay undisturbed, save for the tracks of rabbits and squirrels. Beyond the tall pines, stars glittered like the snowflakes, reluctant to fall. They visited their tree. They stood silently just to be near it, letting the magic of it drift over them. In the pine patch moonlight, the Queen Anne's goblets looked for all the world, looked for all the world like fly greed silver. They walked the creek woods all the way to the zoo, meandering wordlessly throughout the snowy enchantment. As if by design, they both stopped at the same spot above the half submerged, rooty clump of fallen tree. Somewhere under there, they knew, was a den of a family of muskrats. The old man lay a pine branch at the doorway. Maniac whispered, Merry Christmas. They visited the animals at the zoo, at least the outdoor ones, wishing them a happy holiday. The duck seemed particularly pleased to see them. By the time they came to the buffalo pen, dawn was showing through the trees. Before the old man finished saying, want a boost, Maniac was up and over the fence. If Mother Buffalo was glad to see the fence-hopping human again, she didn't show it. But Baby came trotting on over, and the two of them had a warm reunion. Before leaving, Maniac reached into the paper bag and brought out a present. For you, he said. It was a scarf, or rather three scarves tied together. He wrapped them around Baby's neck. Next year, I'll get you stockings for your horns, he grinned. If you have them by then. A final nuzzle, and he was back over the fence. They headed back home as the town awoke. Breakfast was eggnog and hot tea and cookies and carols and colored lights and love. As in all happy Christmas homes, the gifts were under the tree. Maniac gave Grayson a pair of gloves and a woolen cap and a book. The book did not appear to be as sturdy as the others lying around. The cover was blue construction paper and the spine, instead of being bound, was stapled. The text was hand lettered and the pictures were stick figures. The title was The Man Who Struck Out 
uh, Willie Mays. The author's name, which Grayson read aloud with some difficulty, was Jeffrey L. McGee. Maniac, in his turn, opened packages to find a pair of gloves, a box of butterscotch crimpets, and a spanking Snow White never ever used baseball. He was overjoyed. He rushed to the old man and hugged him. The old man put up with that for a second, then pulled away. Hold on, he said. He went to one of the baseball equipment bags and reached in, tunneled down to the bottom, and came up with another package. This one was wrapped crudely in newspaper. Hiding this, and he said, didn't know if you were the kind, if you were the kind of kid sneaks looks. Maniac tore it open and gaped helplessly when he saw what it was. To anyone else, it was a ratty old scrap of leather, barely recognizable as a baseball glove, fit for the garbage can. But Maniac knew at once this was Grayson's, the one he had played with all those years in the minors. It was limp, flat, the pocket long gone. Slowly, timidly, as though entering a shrine, the boy's finger crept into, into it, curled the cracked leather, brought it back to shape, to life. He laid the new ball in the palm, pressed the glove and ball together, and the glove remembered and gave way and made a pocket for the ball. The boy could not take his eyes off the glove. The old man could not take his eyes off the boy. The record player finished the Christmas polka and clicked off, and for a long time there was silence. Five days later, the old man was dead. Chapter 32. Most mornings, Grayson would be the first one out of bed. He would turn on the space heater, visit the Van Shell lavatory, and then heat up some water, get breakfast ready, and finally wake the boy with a gentle shake of the shoulder. On December 30th, it was the silence that woke Maniac in the cold. The space heater wasn't on. No steaming cup sat on the table. The old man was still under the covers. Maniac went over. Grayson, he shook the old man. Grayson, he took the old man's hand. It was cold. Grayson! He didn't run to the superintendent's office. He didn't run to the nearest house. He knew. He held the cold, limp hand that had thrown the pitch, that had struck out Willie Mays, that had betrayed the old man's stoic ways by giving him a squeeze. He began talking to the old man about places he had been on the road, about places the two of them might have gone, about everything. Then he began to read aloud. He read aloud all the books that the old man had learned to read, and he finished with the old man's favorite, Mike Mulligan's steam shovel. When he looked out the window, it was night. He dragged his chest protectors alongside the old man's mat and lay down. Only then, when he closed his eyes, did he cry. The funeral, such as it was, took place on the third day of the new year. Maniac had at last gone to tell someone, the zookeeper, and from then on, he pretty much stayed out of the way. Grayson came to the cemetery in a wooden box. The pallbearers were unknown to Maniac. They were members of the town's trash collecting corps, and as they huffed and bent to lay the box over the hole, they smelled vaguely of pine and rotten fruit. Maniac was the only mourner. He had thought to he had thought the park superintendent might show, or the attendant at the Y locker room, or maybe the lady who ran the park food stand in the summer. None was there. Only Maniac and the man from the funeral home and the six pallbearers and two men off to the side smoking cigarettes and leaning on the hole digging tractor that made Maniac think of something. He smiled inwardly. Hey Grayson. Look, Mike Mulligan's steam shovel had a baby high above a silver plane across the sky, silent as a spider. A boy startled Maniac. When's he coming? It was one of the pallbearers. The man from the funeral home pushed down on, pushed down the top of his black leather glove to expose his watch. Should be here now. Should have been here five minutes ago. How long we got to wait? The funeral man shrugged. All but one of the pallbearers lit up cigarettes. Maniac wished he hadn't come. This event had nothing to do with the man who had once lived in the, in the body in the wooden box. 
I'm freezing my cone yards off, a Paul Bear announced. Me too, said another. Hey, you know, called one of the grave diggers. We ain't waiting all day to fill that hole. Everybody looked at the man in the long black coat. He looked again at his watch. Traffic, probably. The minister thought maniac. That's who we're waiting for. A pallbearer walked over to the funeral man. We hauled this, stu this stiff here. Ain't that enough? They only gave us an hour. Another pallbearer chimed in. Let's go get some donuts. Hot coffee, baby. Loud clinks. A grave, dig a grave digger was striking the baby steam shovel with a spade. The funeral man sighed. He pulled out his own cigarette, lit it from the glowing tip of the pallbearers. Give it two more minutes, then we'll see. Maniac waited for one of those minutes, searching the horizon for signs of the minister. Whatever was going to happen, at the end of the next minute, he didn't want to see it, so he ran. Hey, kid, they called. Yo, kid. But he was running. Running. Running.